find the flux of the vector field across the outward oriented sphere using a parametric description of the surface. So here we are being asked to compute the flux surface integral. So let's quickly recall the definition. So formally, we have the double integral over this surface S of the vector field dotted with the normal vector integrated with respect to the arc length. Now, since arc length isn't a good parameter, we convert this to the computation-ready definition, which is defined as the double integral over this region R, where R is the projection of the surface onto the plane. And this is of the parametrized vector field dotted with the normal vector, which we define here as the cross product of the tangent vector in the u direction with the tangent vector in the v direction. Now, in this example, we have an outward oriented sphere centered at the origin with a radius rho equals 3. So, anytime we're working with a surface that's a sphere and we're asked to use a parametric description of that surface, it's a pretty good assumption that we're going to use spherical coordinates to parametrize this surface. So to begin, let's recall what we know from spherical coordinates, and then we can convert this to that arbitrary two-parameter description. So in this case, we're given, again, a sphere with a radius, rho is equal to 3. So from spherical coordinates, we know from the conversion formulas that x is defined as 3 multiplied by sine of phi times cosine of theta. We know that y is equal to 3 times sine of phi times sine of theta. And we know that z is defined as 3 multiplied by cosine of phi. Now, because we are working with a full sphere here, we can say this is such that our bounds for phi, phi must be greater than or equal to 0, less than or equal to pi. And theta, again, because we have a, a full sphere, theta is going to be greater than or equal to 0, less than or equal to 2 pi. So again, this is what we know from spherical coordinates. And we're going to use this knowledge now to convert this to that arbitrary two-parameter description. So with this two-parameter description, we're going to go ahead and let u be phi, and we'll let v be theta. So now we can say that x in terms of u and v can be defined as 3 times sine of u times cosine of v. We can say that the two-parameter description for y, or y in terms of u and v, is defined as 3 times sine of u multiplied by sine of v. And last but not least, we can say that the two-parameter description for z is defined as 3 times cosine of u. And this is going to be such that u is greater than or equal to 0, less than or equal to pi, and that v is greater than or equal to 0, less than or equal to 2 pi. So this is what we're going to use as the components of the parametrized surface. So now that we officially have this two-parameter description for our surface, the sphere, centered at the origin with a radius of 3, we're ready to start setting up the surface integral. So using this vector-valued function for our surface, we now need to compute the normal vector. So the first vector we need is the tangent vector in the u direction. So in other words, we need to take the partial derivative of vector r with respect to u. So differentiating with respect to u, we are left with the vector with components 3 cosine of u cosine of v. We have 3 cosine of u sine of v. And last but not least, we have minus 3 sine of u. 
So notice that each component has a scalar multiple of three. So we can factor that scalar multiple out. So we have th three times the vector with components cosine of u, cosine of v, cosine of u, sine of v, and minus sine of u. Beautiful! So now we're ready to find the partial derivative of this vector valued function r with respect to v. So differentiating with respect to v, we are left with minus 3 sine of u times sine of v. We have positive 3 sine of u cosine of v. 0. And notice in this case that each component has a scalar multiple of 3 sine of u. So pulling that scalar multiple out, we have 3 sine of u multiplied by minus sine of v cosine of v 0. Now, if you did not pull those scalar multiples out in front, that's okay, you'll still attain the same answer, but factoring those scalar multiples out will help to make the computation of the cross product of these two vectors just a little bit easier. So here we go, the cross product of the tangent vectors. Now don't forget about these scalar multiples. We have a 3 multiplied by a 3 times sine of u out in front of the 3 by 3 determinant. So the first row is i hat, j hat, k hat. The second row is the components of the tangent vector in the u direction. And our third row is the components of the tangent vector in the v direction. So computing this cross product, we are left with, so don't forget we have that 9 sine of u in the front. And then by the cross product, we are left with 0 plus sine of u times cosine of v i hat minus 0 minus sine of u sine of v j hat plus, and then last but not least, we have our kth component or our z component here that's going to leave us with cosine of u multiplied by cosine squared of v plus cosine of u multiplied by sine of v squared k hat. Beautiful! So we can simplify that final component there. Notice that the terms have a scalar multiple of cosine of u. So if we pull that cosine of u out, we see Pythagorean's identity! Woohoo! And so this is going to leave us, you can say that therefore we have a normal vector defined as sine of u, and this is multiplied by the vector with components, sine of u, cosine of v. We then have positive sine of u, sine of v, and our final component is cosine of u. Beautiful! So now that we have our normal vector, we are ready to go ahead and parametrize the vector field using that parametric representation of our sphere. So let's recall that we are given the vector field defined as vector f of x, y, and z is equal to the vector with components 0, 0, z. So with this in mind, we now want to take that parametric representation of our sphere and use it to parametrize this vector field. So we can think about the vector field now as 0, or the vector with components 0, 0, z of u, v. So this is going to leave us with the vector with components 0, 0, 3 cosine of u. And notice we have a scalar multiple of 3 cos of u. 
So we can pull that out into the front, leaving us with the vector 0, 0, 1. Beautiful! So now we officially have everything that we need to go ahead and set up the flux integral for this example and evaluate. So plugging in everything we just found, we have the v integral from 0 to 2 pi. We have the u integral from 0 to pi. And then giving ourselves a little bit more room, we have the integrand, which is the dot product of the parameterized vector field with the normal vector. And then our differential matching the order of integration is du dv. So looking at this integrand, we realize that we have a dot product that needs to be simplified. So computing this dot product, I'm going to bring my scalar multiples to the front. So we have 3 cosine of u multiplied by 9 sine of u. And then our dot product, we have 0 times sine of u cosine of v, which gives us 0 plus 0 times sine of u sine of v, which gives us 0, plus 1 times cosine of u, which leaves us with cosine of u. Beautiful! And so this is leaving us with 27 multiplied by cosine of u squared multiplied by sine of u. So we can now go ahead and rewrite this flux integral And so here we are left with 27 multiplied by the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to pi of cosine of u squared multiplied by sine of u du dv. And we're ready to integrate. So evaluating that inner integral, we have 27 multiplied by the integral from 0 to pi of cosine of u squared multiplied by sine of u du. And so looking at this integrand, we realize we're going to need to use a u substitution. And since we already have the variable u being used, we'll do a w substitution. So I'm going to let my w be a cosine of u. So differentiating with respect to u, we have w du is equal to negative sine of u. And solving for that differential du, we're left with a minus dw all over sine of u is equal to du. So we have our u substitution and our differential substitution. And now changing the bounds to match this new variable, we have w of 0 which will be cosine of 0, which leaves us with 1. And then we have w of pi. And we know that cosine of pi is equal to negative 1. So notice here that these bounds are backwards, but we'll be able to quickly fix that with the order of integration property. So plugging these substitutions in, we have 27 times the integral from 1 to negative 1 of w squared times sine of u multiplied by minus dw all over sine of u. And so we can see those sines of u canceling each other out, leaving us with minus 27 times the integral from 1 to negative 1 of w squared dw. And now here, applying the order of integration property to flip these bounds, we are left with positive 27 multiplied by the integral from negative 1 to 1 of w squared dw. So a cute general antiderivative. This is going to leave us with 9w cubed from negative 1 to positive 1. And evaluating, we're left with 9 times 1 minus a negative 1. So 9 times 2 leaves us with 18. Beautiful. So we can take this and plug it back in to the double integral, and now we're ready to evaluate the outer integral. So this is going to be 18 multiplied by the integral from 0 to 2 pi dv. Another cute general antiderivative. 
This integrates to 18v, and now we evaluate from 0 to 2 pi. So 18 times 2 pi leaves us with a beautiful final answer of 36 pi. So there you have it. This is the outward flux of the vector field across the oriented surface of the sphere centered at the origin with a radius rho equals 3.